Well, hi everybody, it's Tuesday, and so we're messing around with track plans again. And uh, today we're going to be looking at wiring uh, turnouts, not the turnout motors, but powering the rails, and particularly the frog, on uh, model railroad turnouts. This is sort of motivated by the fact that uh, if you've been following along, I've been building this number six turnout on our railroad, uh, mostly from scratch. Uh, and so I'm, I'm to that point now where I'm wiring it. And I know that most of you are not scratch building a number one gauge uh, switch or turnout or points, depending on your vernacular, uh, but you're probably working in HO or N. But, but the rules all apply no matter what your scale or gauge is. So let's just take a look at uh, the various components of a switch. Uh, here are the names in the upper left over there, but let's look at them from an electrical point of view. Starting with the stock rails, uh, at the top we have the black stock rail, at the bottom here the red stock rail. We're using black and red to indicate the normal polarity of our railroad. One rail red, the other black. The points are marked out in blue, and electrically sometimes the points are sort of isolated and they're their own electrical thing. I've also indicated the uh, switch rod in blue because sometimes the switch rod is insulated from the points and sometimes the switch rod is connected to both points so that the points and the switch rod are all one unit electrically. I've indicated the two closure rails here in yellow and they can be handled in several different ways so we'll be talking about the closure rails as a separate entity. And finally, the frog. I've done the frog in green because shouldn't a frog be green? And the frog is always the, the heart of the switch electrically and oftentimes is completely isolated and is its own thing and sometimes not. Oh, and there is one more thing to consider the frog rails. Usually those are just back to our usual black and red, but occasionally not. Sometimes we want to connect those electrically to the frog and make the the switch a selective switch. And there are a number of products available uh, and they all kind of follow the same rules because what we're trying to do is exactly the same. So I'll, I'll be pointing out the different products or, and how they work and how you can adapt to them. But mostly we need to understand the rules here. The heart of the switch is the frog. This is where the left rail crosses over the right rail, and so from an electrical perspective, uh, at this point we would have a dead short because we're bringing the two rails together. Most common practice is to run a red and a black wire around the railroad, and then you can run jumper wires to either of these rails, designate uh, one of the rails as the red rail, the other rail as the black rail. So the simple solution here is to simply make the frog out of uh, an insulated material, out of plastic. The insole frog does just that. It's a plastic frog. And a lot of the most basic switches that you will buy on the market simply come with a, a plastic insulated frog. So there's no power going to the frog. The problem here is obvious. If you've got very small little bits of equipment, little four-wheel, two-axle, uh, goose, uh, rail bus, uh, small porter locomotive, and it only has electrical pickup on those two axles, one of those axles is going to not be picking up power as it crosses the frog, and potentially everything's going to stall. So depending on what kind of equipment you're planning to run, this may not be a problem. But most people find that it is something that they'd like to deal with and they'd rather not use an insulated frog. So it is possible to use a metal frog and therefore you can run power to the frog. But at this point, as the points change, as the blades move from one side to the other, so the polarity on the frog has to change to match the rail. So there's a, a system, it's an older system, it's been around for a long, long time. It's what I used on my HO railroad back in the day. And it's also the system used by Pico's Electrofrog. 
and that's to electrically connect the frog, the closure rails, and the points all together in one continuous circuit. There's a couple of advantages to this, and as always, there's a couple of disadvantages. As the points move back and forth and touch either the red rail or the black rail, that will reverse the polarity of the entire center section of the switch. The points, the closure rails, and the frog. But what that means is you now have continuity through the entire switch, depending on how the switch is thrown, so even the smallest little pieces of equipment will have continuous power running to them as they go through the turnout. Now on the Pico Electro Frog, the frog rails, the rails here beyond the frog, are electrically connected to the frog. So when the switch is thrown, that kills the power to the diverging route. So in this case, the power is going to the tangent straight line, while power is completely killed to the diverging route. And that can be really handy on a DC railroad. And this applies to both routes, both the tangent and the divergent. Whichever route is not selected is electrically shut off. So any locomotive or, or powered equipment of any kind down that route is going to be effectively shut off by the points being set in the opposite direction, something called selective control. Now, because Pico's Electro Frog is set up this way, if you don't want the selective control, if you still want power going to either of these routes all the time, you have to place uh, an insulated rail jointer uh, on the frog rails at this point and or this point, and then run jumper wires from your red and black bus up to the track beyond the switch so that it has power. Otherwise, throwing the points on the switch will completely shut off the route not selected. Now what that means is, electrically speaking, your frog extends all the way to this point. And that might seem to be awkward, but if you think about it, there's no reason for a locomotive to be entering that area at all unless the points are aligned to that route. So it really doesn't become an issue that for electrical purposes, your frog power is routed all the way out to the end of the switch. This makes this style of switch ideally suited to a DC railroad, but not so much a DCC railroad. This would be inconvenient on a DCC railroad. This is actually how I have our logging railroad set up. There's only one switch up there. And that's the little stub end that goes into the locomotive shop. And since I'm currently running the logging railroad only on DC, that means I can pull a locomotive into the engine shop, throw the switch back to the main, thereby killing the power in the engine shop. The lights on the locomotive therefore go out because it no longer has power going to it. But that way I can continue to run the railroad with the locomotive parked in the engine shop. And, you know, 20 years ago when I had an HO railroad, this is how all of the switches on that railroad were set up because uh, it was a DC only railroad. And I was scratch building all of my own switches. So this was just the most convenient way to do that. One of the advantages that I found where I was building my own switches is I had a metal strap here between the end of the points and I could solder that in place and then the rest of the throw rod would be made out of uh, insulated material like plastic. But that gave me a super solid connection here at the points that I knew would never come loose because the two points uh, and the, the crossbar between them were all soldered together and that whole thing attached to the throw bar. One of the disadvantages is you're counting on electrical connection here between the stock rail and the points as the points move back and forth. So if you get any kind of ballast or gunk or dirt going on in that gap, uh, you're going to lose the power feed to the entire center section of your switch because you're counting on the moving points to make continuity and therefore route power through the entire center section of the switch. And if you're using selective control, you just lost power to your entire railroad beyond the switch, however you've got that set up. 
So uh, whatever is beyond the, the points is all being powered through the points. And so, boy, that's just not a very good way to do that at all. So it's, it's really important if you're going to use this system to augment that connection with an actual physical switch. A lot of the commercially available switch machines, like this tortoise switch machine, actually have a built-in double pole, double throw switch, and you can simply tie into that and use it to route power to your frog and uh, closure rails and points. The disadvantage here, and I've discovered it accidentally several times, is if you're using a really high amperage power supply, uh, like I have tended to do, like a 10 amp, and you short out the points, the switch inside here will immediately burn out because it can't take that kind of amperage at a dead short. Fortunately, it's a double pull, double throw, and in this case, I'm only using one of those sets of contacts, so if I fry the whole thing, I just switch over to the other set of contacts. The reason they're providing a double pull, double throw switch is so that you can also use the switch machine to control a reversing loop. We're just using the other set of contacts because, you know, oops. Moreover, if you're using a manual throw and you're willing to rely on the points contact in the stock rail to provide power, it's really electrically simple. All you have to do is put a little uh, ground throw on this and throw it back and forth and it just simply works. But if you're using a switch machine or you're rigging some sort of micro switch to your linkage all to route power that way, or you're using some electronic system, which we'll get into, then there's really no point in tying all of this together electrically. All you really want to change polarity on is the frog. So if you have a electrically isolated metal frog with a jumper wire going to it, then all you really need to be doing here is changing the polarity on the frog. And if you're using like the tortoise switch machine, you can run the jumper wire from the frog over to the tortoise switch machine, and that's all there is to it. So this is the simplest system. If you have access to some sort of power router, a uh, switch on your switch machine, some micro switch that you've rigged to the linkage, even a toggle switch just mounted to the front of the layout as long as you remember to throw the switch before running a train through there. Or as we mentioned before, some of the electronic frog juicing systems and you can tie it into that. So this has become the most popular switch currently because it's the most friendly to DCC railroads because there's power running to everything all the time and the frog simply changes polarity and if you're using an electronic frog juicer with DCC you don't have to think about the frog at all it just manages itself as it needs to change polarity it just simply does as I mentioned before I'm going to do an entire video just on electronic frog juicing systems so this is the system that we're using on the new switch that we're putting on the railroad. And in fact, it's the system we're using on the entire main part of the railroad. The only part where we're using the selective control is up on the logging railroad because the logging railroad is DC. The main railroad is all DCC. And so it makes the most sense to use electronic frog juicing systems. So while the Pico Electro Frog or similar design is the ideal system if you're using DC on your railroad, the new Pico or newer, I should say, Pico Unifrog has been designed for use on DCC. So it's similar to the old Insel Frog, except that the frog has these metal pieces. They're very small so you can leave it not hooked up to anything and most equipment will go right through there just like they would with the insel frog but uh, it does have metal parts to the frog and it has this little jumper wire going to the frog so that you can power it separately so if you look on the back side of the switch all of the jumper wires that connect everything together are exposed and therefore, should you want to rewire this in any configuration that you want, it's pretty easy to just snip these jumper wires and then connect to them and reconfigure the switch into anything that you want. 
Over here we can see the jumper wires that connect the closure rails to the stock rails. So should you want to do some sort of a selective control where the closure rails are tied electrically to the frog instead of to the stock rails, you can simply snip right here and make a couple of solder connections and do that. Over here we have the jumper wires that connect the frog rails, the rails past the frog, to the stock rails. So should you want to do a DC uh, selective control and tie the frog rails to the frog, you can snip these two jumper wires and connect them to the same power that you're running to the frog. And then you now have uh, selective control to everything beyond the switch, just like we had with the, uh, the electro frog. And right here we have the jumper wire that goes to the frog itself, and that can be connected to any system that you want to use for powering the frog. In the case of DCC, most often that would be a frog juicer, an electronic circuit for powering the frog. And while the Pico uh, Unifrog is probably the gold standard for doing this kind of thing, the other companies all seem to offer some variation on it. This is the very basic Atlas Custom Line Mark II in brass. Uh, it's also available in nickel. But you can see it too has a metal frog and it's fairly easy to tie into this metal frog and power the frog separately. So uh, at any rate, back to our railroad where we're hand laying and hand building everything and running DCC on the, the main line out to the garden and so on. Uh, here again, we're just powering all the rails all the time except for the frog and the frog is on a separate circuit and that's going to be fed through an electronic frog juicer. And uh, we'll be putting up a video about how to use these electronic uh, frog juicers. Well, I hope you found this informative uh, and that you now know everything there is to know about the various ways of routing power to a turnout. If you're not a subscriber to the channel, please hit the upcoming subscribe button. It helps us out and, and it will keep you informed when we put a new video up, which is twice a week. So uh, you would want to be informed of that, I hope. And uh, the easy peasy way is to click on the upcoming blue button. Zoink! Right there at the blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And Karen and I will see you here on Sunday. See you then. Bye-bye.